All right, I think we can start. Welcome. I'm Klaus, and this is Mark, and we work at a company called Otokon. It's a company located in Copenhagen, Denmark, and we design hearing aids. I think uh, most of you are familiar with the Zephyr project. If you're not, here's a super short version. Zephyr is a real-time operating system optimized for resource-constrained devices. I'm saying something like a hearing aid, which I'm holding here, it's a resource-constrained uh, resource device, is uh, almost an understatement. I think most people are familiar with hearing aids. They know somebody who has a hearing aid. And uh, just from looking at it, you can see that physically, obviously, it's constrained. It's, uh, it's one of the only devices that I know of where the size of the chip inside actually dictates the size of the product. So if you were to make the chip just a little wider, you'd also be making the hearing aid a bit wider. Now, due to all these constraints, it's also computationally constrained. Um, I know a lot of the other platforms in the Zephyr project, they, um, they have many megahertz processors running Cortex something something. We have a much smaller but I would still say that for the size of a hearing aid, it's still quite capable. Obviously, due to, again, to, due to the size, um, the battery that you can fit in here is quite small, so battery life is, of course, almost everything uh, when you're designing a, a hearing aid. Now, when we saw the Zephyr project with its focus on, on the resource-constrained devices, we thought that was a, a great fit, and we were happy to join uh, that effort. Um, another thing that's quite interesting about uh, something as little and small and, but still very complex and pretty expensive is that despite all that, it's still a commercial product. And it is sold in volume. It's sold in millions. That makes it an interesting uh, product. Which gets us to why this talk. Um, we think that with all this... Um, custom stuff, all this uh, special stuff that's inside a hearing aid here, uh, it makes it uh, pretty complex. And, and you could say that if you have uh, an open source project that you can make run on a hearing aid, well, then you can pretty much run it anywhere. This talk will not be about how we ported uh, Zephyr to our specific architecture. There's already been uh, talks on that. Um, I think there was one last year uh, called uh, Enabling Zephyr on Your Hardware. You can go look in the ELC archive if you want to see that. They'll document all, all the stuff where you uh, write all the assembly code for the task switching, the timers, and all that. This talk is not about that. Uh, in summary, you can say that it was quite uneventful. It, uh, the API was good. The hooks were there. The documentation was good. Uh, not much to talk about. What this talk is about is um, the challenges, the other, the more general challenges we faced when porting Zephyr to something as specialized as a hearing aid. Now, a hearing aid, a lot of people, they, when they think of a hearing aid, they think just of a glorified amplifier. They think it's something that just takes the sound from the environment, amplifies it into the human ear canal, and that's pretty much it. Uh, it might have used to be like that. It's a long time ago. Uh, modern hearing aids are a lot more advanced than that. Uh, a modern hearing aid will analyze the sound environment uh, many times a second, and uh, do a lot of heavy uh, digital signal processing. It's something that is going on constantly, so it's an always-on process, always draining the battery. Battery life, like I say, is key. Um, a modern hearing aid will also include something as a wireless 2.4 gigahertz Bluetooth low energy. Uh, enables you to make connections to your iPhone. It even does audio streaming directly from the phone to the ear. Also, it actually enables uh, communication with TV, so you can stream TV audio directly into your hearing aid. Uh, it also has actually a magnetic link, data link between each ear, so that it can sync up stuff like volume, uh, program selection, stuff like that. And it does that with a battery of the size of an Altoids Mint, a tiny battery, uh, and it has to have a battery life of multiple days. Now, how do we do that? If you pop the hood of a hearing aid, you'll find that there's three custom ASICs inside. There's the DSP, the Digital Signal Processor, the RF, the one that enables us to communicate with the, the, the iPhone, the TVs, and there's an analog front end. And on these chips, there's 
uh, many cord system. So I think we're actually up to 11 cores on the, this current generation of, the, of hearing aids, all optimized for their specific purposes. Some will be analyzing sound, some will do power management, uh, all very power efficient. These cores and all the peripherals, they're communicating using a network on chip. If you're not familiar with a network on chip, a network on chip is, as opposed to a bus-based based system, it's a routed network on the chip, just like your um, Ethernet. Um, this uh, enables, uh, first of all, it, it's lower power. It uh, helps with routing congestion. It helps with timing closure. Also, under the hood of a hearing aid, there's, uh, of course, a Bluetooth baseband. That's what enables our 2.4 gigahertz uh, communication. Uh, and yeah, like I said, a lot of custom processes. And the custom processes is where the first real challenge comes in. Because obviously, a custom processor will be having a very specialized tool chain also. Um, so, Zephyr, uh, when we joined, it was favoring GNU-like tool chains. Uh, we needed to have our special tool chain also uh, be supported. Um, so it might sound like we're trying to push something specialized into an open source project. That wouldn't be very nice. But what we were actually doing were we we're abstracting the tool chain. Uh, I think that's very important for a project like Zephyr that uh, is focusing on the edge of the network. So we've moved away from the general computing where you have all the uh, normal processes, all the, the GNU-like tools, and out to the edge where you'll find something like a hearing aid with this very specialized tool chain. So, so, as Carlos mentioned, Zephyr was limited by GNU assumptions, um, both in C code and in CMake. Uh, Zephyr uses the CMake build system. Um, so, you would find things in the root CMake file that was uh, basically a mixed bag of, of flags that uh, the tool chain had to support. So, you would find like things like hard coded verbatim dash G and warning all and uh, I macros and freestanding. And these are flags that our tool chain doesn't support. Um, of course, it can implement uh, similar things, but they're written in a slightly different syntactical way. Uh, but the intent is the same. And uh, of course, we want to adhere to that intent. So maybe that's what we should make. Uh, the, the CMake build system do, that's what we have been doing. Um, so we have abstracted all of these uh, hard-coded flags into basically a tool chain API. Uh, so a tool chain can implement these and you will port uh, GNU GCC and the GNU LD and the linker and the bin utilities into these macros and provide the same kind of interface. Um, and we would simply do the same. So it wouldn't be special GNU, it would just be uh, abstracted. So uh, we have them by intent and we have them categorized. So you have the CC for the compiler and LD for the linker uh, and bin tools for the uh, bin utilities. Uh, yeah, and um, that's been quite a long uh, pathway underway. Um, it's been slow moving, um, but it's nearing completion. So there are still some rough edges, um, especially user space and memory separation in Zephyr is a bit, uh, uh, yeah, long and uh, uh, hard-coded in the CMake system, um, in Zephyr's use of the CMake system. And you can still find remnants like uh, dash L in the EXT modules. And uh, yeah, you could use a general cleanup of the CMake root file still. That may happen. Yep. All right. Another challenge when you have a specialized system like a hearing aid is that most of the code that you'll be writing is proprietary. So you have a system where even something as simple as timers or the SPI or I2C driver will be specifically aimed at our version of that particular core with fixes for our silicon box and stuff like that. So all these drivers that are proprietary um, become a problem in the Zephyr project. We'll see why later. Um, there can be multiple reasons why you would want to have a proprietary code. Of course, ideally, you tr try to upstream as much as possible. Um, 
first of all, it could be that it's a uh, secret, of course, but it could also be that it's just of no use to anyone else. It could be that it's third-party license or that you are keeping it in a separate version control system uh, that you don't want to share with the, the Zephyr tree. So the problem was that Zephyr, when we joined, um, only supported to keep code in the tree. So if you were writing a proprietary driver, uh, you would uh, uh, you'd have a giant diff up to the upstream. If you want to follow the upstream as much as possible, then you would need to, to always look at this diff. So there are some common solutions. Of course, you could just use your .git ignore. But then again, that's also a version controlled uh, file, and you would have to maintain your own branch. And it doesn't really scale well if there's a lot of uh, files scattered across the system. And we thought maybe we could use something like Simlinks, but then again, that's never really the solution. It's always a bit of a hassle. It's a recipe for disaster. Uh, build systems, should they follow, should they not? All these problems that come along. We also thought about taking our proprietary driver code and copying it in during the build, but that's really also just asking for trouble. Um, all kinds of race conditions. When do you clean up? When do you not? Uh, the elegant way, I think, would be to have some kind of overlay where you could overlay the Zephyr uh, file tree with your own version and then uh, have Zephyr pick uh, the overlay. But, but the build system as it was, uh, as it is now, doesn't really have the infrastructure. It would be a major change. So the solution we came up with was adding some command line options. Uh, you can see them here. Uh, where we can now say, well, if you have... Uh, proprietary code, as you have a lot with these uh, commercial products, you can just specify that your architecture, instead of taking it from the Zephyr tree, you'll be taking it from somewhere other, uh, some other place on your file system. Same goes for the board, the tool chain, uh, the SOC. Uh, we're also working on doing that for drivers and for subsystems. Yep. So that was basically uh, building. So CMake and locating source code. Um, a few changes was also needed uh, to, uh, to the Zephyr Bluetooth link layer stack. Um, fortunately, Zephyr was already out of the box, uh, pretty much NDNS portable. However, um, not the Bluetooth link layer. So we still had to find uh, the NDNS issues and, and correct those. Um, and we have done that before. Uh, it's not a new thing for us. Um, we are big Endian. Um, so, but this time around, we have actually come up with a clever, uh, generic, semi-automated way of doing that. Uh, that is not Zephyr specific, so other projects could, could use this. So, um, NDNS bugs, right? It's uh, the byte order interpretation. Um, that's kind of a subtle thing, so you need to be very careful when you read the code. You need to follow the data flow. You need to track the flow of it and uh, with special glasses on, can it be interpreted in a different way? Uh, is it cast to an array of uh, uint 16 at some point and used? Well, um, that takes time. So um, you need to review. And when you have found your uh, sources, uh, hopefully they're kind of following the same pattern and you may easily fix them. Uh, however, since the world is like de facto Little Endian, they're likely to reappear for you if you're a big Endian. So we want something that is like uh, suitable for a regression test. So um, yeah, we had to do a bit of work in the controller. Um, but um, how do we find them? Uh, because uh, we don't want to invest a lot of time in just uh, reading through ever-changing code. So uh, static analysis, we have tried that. Um, doesn't really work well. If you know about any static analysis tool that can do that, then please come talk with us after the talk. Um, so the traditional way has simply been review and this kind of empirical discovery. Um, but how do we do a better or quicker empirical discovery process? Could we accelerate that somehow? And it turns out that we can. So for us, uh, uh, for Uticon, one of our contributions is this uh, BabelSim uh, project, which is Zephyr agnostic, but largely uh, built for uh, Zephyr. Um, it is a physical layer simulator 
So you can simulate Bluetooth traffic using that, or any kind of traffic, but specifically we use it for Bluetooth, any kind of radio traffic. Um, the neat thing is that it's reproducible, it's very fast, it's fat, super real, super real time, so you can like run orders of magnitude faster than real time. Uh, that's good for debugging uh, and uh, doing it quickly and running it in regression. It's also deterministic and reproducible. So you don't have to worry about stochastic wireless behavior. You don't have to take all your boards and physically run them for hours. You can actually run all your tests in minutes, which is a neat thing. Um, so could we take that and then, let's say, in an ideal dreamland world, could you take your Bluetooth test case setup, your topology, could you run that in a big endian target and a little endian target uh, of some test case that produces some logs and maybe that set of logs you can diff and you could detect if you had endianess issues. Um, and it turns out that we can because BabelSim and another Autocon contribution, uh, native POSIX architecture uh, in Zephyr, uh, allows us to build Zephyr as a Linux binary, just a userland binary, and let it connect up to BabelSim. There's an NRF52 BabelSim target board uh, in Zephyr. So you can take the constellation of uh, any kind of topology, Bluetooth test case, you can run it, and they're all Linux userland processes, and since they're just Linux processes, you can capitalize on all the wealth of open source tools. So you have GDB, you have Coxinel, you have Docker, Valgrind, and QEMO. But you, you can see, because uh, we, we uh, had some, uh, um, we have, uh, we use RR instead. It's the reversible debugger. GD, nothing against GDB, GDB is fine, but RR is even better, so. Yeah. Um, um, uh, so, but you can see that we have highlighted QEMU and uh, Coxinet. And um, so we will, we will explain. Um, by QEMU, we don't mean the board simulation. So it's not a full board. We use the, uh, in this context here, we use the uh, user mode emulation. So you, take, you can run a foreign binary under the same kernel. QEMU user mode will intercept the system calls and uh, issue them on your behalf. So you can run, you can take a MIPS binary and run it on x86 under the same kernel. It will appear the same. And that goes for entire user land. So you can actually install, let's say Debian, as we will see, uh, completely foreign. And that's what we're gonna do. Uh, so we're gonna compile BabelSim and uh, Zephyr for native POSIX for MIPS, little and big, under the exact same software versions and just run it twice. And that will give us air logs, thanks to BabelSim. And then we can diff those logs. But that will basically just branch out very early. And we will just see, yep, yeah, there is at least one endiness error, but not tell us where. So that's where the location comes into play. And um, if we instrument, so the code that we suspect to have some endiness errors, um, in our case, the controller, we may write a semantic patch with Coxinel to inject some source level tracing into that code and simply do another run. And then we get more very verbose logs and a much earlier branch out point. So to facilitate that, um, we have contributed another small project, uh, Debian Foreign, you may find it down there. Um, and it basically just provides a for each architecture thing. And the payload is whatever Linux executable script or whatever you may, your heart desire is. So um, it's just to facilitate the setup um, and making it, so it's, it's a Docker image and uh, it comes pre-baked with, uh, with these two uh, Debian uh, foreign environments. So it's a, a MIPS uh, little endian and a MIPS big endian. And uh, within them, what you want to run is, of course, two instances of Zephyr. Uh, so in our case, it's the basic connection test. So there's a peripheral and a central. And you want to connect those up to BabelSim, so the, the air scheduler. 
And that will produce this set of traces, a set of logs. And so you take these two sets of logs, and we will diff those logs. Yes. Make sense? Good. OK, so before the demo, um, let's look at uh, how we inject these uh, traces. So um, normally, Coxinell is not used for this kind of thing. Uh, it's more like what, uh, meant for retroactive. You have identified some bug, and now you need to patch that in across a million lines of uh, Linux kernel source code. But here, we actually use Coxinell in a slightly different way as an active debugging tool um, to instrument code. So one thing is just basic control flow. And uh, these are written up in uh, unified, as a kind of unified diff. Um, you have an optional name and the qualifiers that you want to match for. So a type, an identifier. So this is like a C-specific uh, um, SED, uh, uh, grep and replacement thing. Just knowledgeable about C and the abstract syntax tree of C. So you want to match uh, for every function. You want to match every expression in every function. And when you encounter that, you want to put in a trace statement just before that. So this my trace will then be some kind of macro. Um, and for us, we put that in a globally included POSIX cheat for Cepher. So it's always defined. Uh, and we just define it to some printf function, printk function, that stringifies the argument and just prints it out. Yep. So that gives us control flow. But for NDNS, we actually want to have differences in these logs for data for the actual values. So then we also do the same for scalar uh, quantities. So for any kind of uint 8, 16, 32, 64, um, any kind of scalar value except you know, uh, pointers and arrays and na 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 structures, we, we trace those out. So again, every function, we have any variable x that is updated. It's assigned something. Um, E, and then we trace out the new value of this x. And we do something similar for initialization and return. OK. So when we have all of those patches written up, we also want to include a remove traces in the very top. Because if we apply the same semantic patch multiple times, then it's also going to uh, trace the trace statements which is not so nice. So we want to first remove those, peel those out again. So um, that allows us to reapply it multiple times. And that is the definition of item potence. So that's a bit, makes it a bit more easy or um, yeah, a bit easier to work with. Um, then as another convenience is just a small bash function called instrument. We're going to see that in a moment. And it just takes the path to a file that you have a suspect, um, and it will produce a temporary file. And uh, to the original file, you will apply the semantic patch. And we are going to review the difference. So then you actually get the option of selectively including or just merging all the instrumented traces over. Maybe you know there is a false uh, positive that you don't want, then you have at least the option through uh, meld or any kind of diff editor to, to do that. <clears throat> All right, demo time. So this is unfortunately recorded, uh, because otherwise the build times uh, is about 30 seconds each every time. So that's a bit uh, too much. Um, yep, so we are, first of all, in a uh, workspace here. So this is a fully furnished pre-baked uh, Debian foreign Docker image. Um, this is actually the, the, the host. But um, we already have a Cepher workspace. And this workspace has been mapped through in Docker and in the secure uh, change route uh, all the way through. So this is fully visible for everybody, the workspace path. So it's the same source. And uh, we are using here a old uh, Cepher something something from 2nd of January, that actually contains these NDNS bugs still. And then we have a few uh, hacks on top. 
just to make sure that it actually native Pro 6 can compile on this uh, kind of specialized uh, MUPS thing. Yep. <coughs> and uh, so we enter into the Docker, and we will we get the for each command, and it's simply a, a, a secure uh, CRUD um, for each of them. And we have the fetching and the building and running phases. Pretty standard. And then we will proceed to fetch and build now. So we first <coughs> fetch and build. Now build. This is build. And it's building twice, right? So it's building for MIPS and MIPS uh, big and little engine. And it's building uh, two Zephyr, the peripheral and the, the central. And then we are running BabelSim twice, and we get this, as you can see, the two sets of logs. So you have MIPS as big endian and little endian MIPSL. And these are the, the participating uh, uh, device or uh, processes. So there's the central and the peripheral, and the BabelSim uh, scheduler itself. <coughs> And then we will look at the, we will pick for the uh, peripheral. We will just inspect the diff. And there is a diff, um, but it's quite short and it was just in the like host thing here. So nothing, not much to see. But let's instrument with the coccinella patch. So we instrument the controller. And then meld pops up, and we can see what the patch did. And then we, we get to see that, yeah, yeah, there are some UN8. And we just merge all over, save, build again. And run again. And in the run, here we run then you get to see we have a lot of output. But this is uh, captured in the log files. And we have data values, right? So this is interesting. So then we get to look at diff. And whoop, lo and behold, you, we actually get to see like 65,536 becomes a 1. <clears throat> at line, I don't know, 12,000 something in control.c in role disable function. So there might be an NDNS issue there that you want to look at. And you can look at other things. So you want to fix that first and redo, rinse and repeat. Um, you may not trust the further down you go. That could just be derivative effects. Uh, but you can be pretty sure that the first diff will be a source of NDNS issue. Yeah, you can see other places here. Yep. All right. So this is by no means the only things that uh, Autogon has contributed. Just to summarize, we have uh, done a lot of uh, portability pipe cleaning. So C99 stuff, uh, the tool chain abstraction, uh, the out of tree, uh, Bluetooth, a lot of stuff on Bluetooth. Um, so we have split the link layer. So you can have a common part, an upper and a lower link layer. So you can actually port more easily to custom radios or other radios. So there's a common and lower part. All these NDNS issues, how we serialize the Bluetooth settings, vendor extensions, because we need proprietary protocols to be possible. We need to support audio as well. Uh, and then there is uh, the native POSIX, which is the port of Zephyr um, to POSIX threads. So yeah, it becomes a Linux executable. And then you add in, uh, for instance, uh, um, some transaction level models of well-known hardware, example the NRF52. Um, and then you can run that within BabelSim. Uh, as a complete test case. 
just exclusively on, uh, on Linux. Uh, then we have tracing. We have a, a common trace format backend in Zephyr. Um, we're going to work and extend on that uh, in the future. Tracing is very important to us. Um, we want to have it more graphical. And we also want to investigate the kernel shock too when it's actually released. Uh, yeah, more Bluetooth, more optimization. We are a hearing aid after all. We need to be efficient. Um, the tool chain abstraction is close to completion. Um, there are still these uh, minor things left. Um, we want to improve this uh, graphical presentation such that anybody, not just people with um, an ARM real-time tracing framework and Sega uh, RTT can actually do graphical debugging and visualizing of all the kernel context switches and locking and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and uh, then also Zephyr as a component, having Zephyr more um, not as an owner of the entire platform. That may have been kind of the assumption of Zephyr until now, at least for us. And uh, then more modularity and house. Then, uh, yeah, links in case you want to dig in to some of the stuff here. Questions? I think we have three minutes for questions. What the difference is, there are many differences. Um, so first of all, the most visible thing from the build system is, of course, the flags, right? So uh, of course, we need to provide flags that work. Um, and our compiler uses very different flags. Um, uh, GCC is, uh, I mean, uh, GCC works and our compiler works there. I mean, you would have to dig into. Um, so the difference is that ours is, has a Clang front end. And then there's a custom like middle and back end. But it is Clang in the front end, but with different, just for the parser, not for the command line switches. In case that, yeah. Yep. So, regarding the tool chain stuff, um, have you considered using something to build your. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm just going to throw it out there. Have you considered using Yocto, and obviously not for Linux, but Yocto is able to build you a tool chain? Right? You can build. Yeah, but. but it's a meta separate layer that you can use, and so yep. you can build your own tool chain. Yeah. You can use that, to, you have control over that. Sure. Build separate on top of that. Yeah. I guess that would solve the overlay issue as well. Uh, I we I know about Yocto. Um, uh, but this is a hearing aid. It doesn't uh, run Linux, right? No, 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 no. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like just for the tool chain. Like Yocto, it is. It, it's, it's meant to build Linux. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it's just able okay. to build it. So there's a part of Yocto chain, that could be and then relevant. You can build separate on top of that. Okay. We, yeah. we can take this off. Yeah. Um, also, the compiler is, is very special. It has to be our compiler. Sure. So, yeah, okay. But, we, yeah, we can talk. Yep. The battery life of... Can you repeat that? You cannot. Uh, the battery life of a hearing aid? Of our hearing aid. It's, uh, I think it's about 60 hours, right? So yeah, a couple of days. Time, right? Yeah, so a couple of days of use. I think the battery is 160 milliamp hour. Yeah. I mean, of course, it, everything is relative, so it depends on what you're doing. If you're wireless streaming audio all the time, then it's a bit less. Um, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but but I, I mean, it's meant for kind of a week, right? It's kind of it. That's the range. It's definitely been thought about, but I don't think it's feasible uh, at this point. Um, I think it's, you just don't get enough out of it, uh, the energy harvesting. Yeah. Yeah. I have another question. Yep. It, sure. Does it have anything to do with it? But like the hearing aid, is it, I know there's different types. Is it one of like, you know, there's a bone structure one, there's a... Bone anchored, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, yes. is it one of those? Uh, so we, we support that. Um, we have that. We also have cochlear implants okay. where it's actually like yeah, embedded outside. inside. Um, 
these typically run at a cadence that is like delayed because of medical certification, more strictness. Um, uh, but um, yeah, okay. sure. Uh, we're under uh, FDA, so it's, uh, I can't remember, class something, uh, yeah. Yeah, there are, there are strict things. I mean, uh, all the source code that we have, um, we need to document, prove that everything has been reviewed. So yeah, that's labor intensive. Um, and there are risk assessment and stuff like that also. We need to guarantee or at least document that it cannot be possible to blow a person's um, eardrum out, for instance. Yep. Thank you. All right. No problem. Thank you.